name is Elizabeth Norton, and I'm a Simons Postdoctoral Fellow. Um, and it's my pleasure this evening to introduce Jamie McPartland, who's our speaker. When the Simons Foundation at MIT uh, Simons Center asked the postdoctoral fellows to think about researchers we'd like to invite to come and give a colloquium in the upcoming year, uh, I thought about whose work had been in my mind as I was coming up with my project for the, the Simons Fellowship that I'm working on, and I'm studying face processing and using EEG and MRI. And uh, Jamie's work in the EEG of face processing and autism had been very influential in my thinking, and I think that um, one of the reasons that's really exciting to have him is that he brings not only a very careful clinical background to his work, but he also has um, an, uh, a really nuanced and precise approach to EEG analysis that, um, that really makes his work exemplary. And so he received his PhD in child clinical psychology at the University of Washington, and then went on to Yale where he's been a member of the Child Study Center and the Department of Psychology. And he's now an associate professor there. And he has received a number of impressive grants and awards. Um, and tonight he's gonna tell us about his research on the clinical neuroscience of the social brain, uh, social brain development in ASD. So please welcome Jamie McPartland. Thank you. Whoa. Thank you very much. It's really a, it's a pleasure to, to be here in many, many ways. So I, I went to college in Cambridge at the other, the other school with the, why is every college in Boston have some variant of red as their color? It seems kind of confusing to me. I think they should mix it up. But it's so, um, it's really, really, really fun for me to be back in Cambridge. This is my favorite place in the world. And things that weren't, wouldn't occur to you to be meaningful, like the smell of a tea station, are so <laughs> evocative for me. So it's, so it's really good to be back. And it's also, it's, uh, I'm a big fan and have been very influenced by a lot of the work that has been done here and by people in this room. So it's really an honor to have the, the chance to talk to you about the work that I do. And I hope that you, um, are gentle when you're telling me the things that I'm wrong about. So, uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about clinical neuroscience, which is kind of, and, I, and I'll say what I mean by clinical neuroscience. So these are the, the, this is what supports me and supports my research, and there's no conflicts with anything that I'll talk about today. And tell me if there's, um, I'm hearing a little feedback. I don't know if it's bothering anybody else. Is there, if turning down the um, volume, would that do it? Is that better? Can you still hear me now as this feedback? Great. Okay, so what I want to talk a little bit about is what I mean by clinical neuroscience, which is kind of the way, the way that I think about studying autism and is a reflection of my training and the kinds of things that I'm, that I'm interested and capable of doing. And then I'll talk about um, the theoretical model around which my research is based, which has been really helpful for me in uh, kind of having a roadmap for what I'm going to study. And then some of the predictions I've done, um, experiments to test things that should be true, if this model is a useful way of thinking about things. And then some things that I think are wrong about the model and ways that I'm evolving it. And then really, most importantly to me, is then thinking about how some of this stuff might matter. How can the research that we're doing in the lab actually affect the lives of people with autism and their families. So let me start by telling you what I mean when I say clinical neuroscience, because I think it can mean it's used in a lot of different ways. So I think about it is because I wear a few different hats. So my, my training is as, a, is as a clinical psychologist, and I still do clinical work. One of the jobs that I do is to, to run the autism clinic at the Child Study Center. And that is something that is re rewarding to me and something that I think is important in a first order way, but I think it's also a really Im important part of, uh, of my science. So I think about bringing together different, different roles to do better research in my lab. So I think that being a clinician is really helpful to me as a scientist for a few reasons. One, um, is spending time with ch studying a clinical disorder, it's really helpful to spend time with the people who are affected about, by it. It gives me ideas. It gives me hunches. I've worked very closely with Ami Klin, who, who always used to say in a, in, a much, in, in a cool accent that I won't try to imitate, he would say, our best hypotheses come from the playrooms. And I think that's true. It gives us ideas about what's important. And it gives us a sense of, of what are the things, I mean, and I'm sure I'll lapse into this. And I'm sure I'll talk about all the things that people on the spectrum have trouble with, but I think that also gives us a chance to appreciate the things that people on the spectrum are, are, are good at, because they're better at some things than, than many of us are. 
I think another benefit of being a clinician is that it gives, it gives you an opportunity to hear from people who are affected by autism what's important to them. Right? I think we as scientists possess a very specific species of hubris where we are certain that the line of research that we were pursu are pursuing is the answer. But I think that we can temper that by hearing from families, whether the things that we're studying are things that they think will make an impact on their lives. So, so those are all the kinds of things that I think are really helpful about being a clinician. I think that there are things that, there are limits of clinical insight. And I think that in our lab, we seek to, to, to bolster those with neuroscience. So what are some of the things that, that I see neuroscience bringing to our work? So, one, understanding mechanisms, right? If we, if we make hunches, we can look at mechanisms with the tools of neuroscience. I think that even a, a really, really good clinician, there are things that that clinician will never detect for a host of reasons. And I think neuroscience methods can much, be much more subtle. There might be things that, that haven't emerged in development yet, haven't emerged in behavior yet. There might be things that are too inconsistent to observe clinically. Um, and there might be some things that are just unobservable, right? If the behavior that we see is the, is the synthesis of many different processes, there might be differences between typical and atypical development that are only evident when you look at some of these processes. And then also, neuroscience gives us objectivity. I think we've come, I think we do a remarkable job as clinicians now, when you, you know, 20 years ago, to say that you were going to try to assign a number to someone's social performance and then have that be reliable with an assessor, you know, a half a world away, it seems like a, an impossible challenge. But we do that pretty well now. That said, you know, even these really elegant tools that we've created are not as objective and as consistent as neuroscience, right? If I put someone in my lab in New Haven and I put someone in EEG lab with identical equipment here, we're going to get the same kind of data. And I think that's important. And so I, where do I see these kinds of things coming together is in, tr in translation, right? The idea that the, these discoveries that we make can have real utility in a person's life. There's specific kinds of translational goals that I'm interested in in my research are really related to diagnosis and treatment. Are there ways that we can detect things, social development going differently before it becomes evident in behavior, before it becomes problematic? Are there ways that we can use the sensitivity of neuroscience tools to predict who's more likely to respond to a kind of treatment or to measure whether a person is responding to a treatment in a, earlier in the course of treatment or with greater sensitivity? So, so those are the conventional means of translation, but I think also being a clinician, I mean translation also in a really, really rigid and literal way too. Because I think it's, I, you know, I've said being a clinician makes me a better science, scientist, but I think the opposite is true. I think it's helpful to me to be the clinician sitting at a, a table with a family trying to understand what autism is when I'm a person who's up to date on the research. I think it, it helps you help a family understand things in different ways. And the idea of all of this is that taken together, all these things are going to improve, improve the quality of life for people. And, I, and I, this is another benefit, I think, of being a clinician and a scientist. I think that clinical, clinical benefits are often more proximal in time, but narrow in scope. Right? If you're doing a decent job as a clinician, the, the person who, 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 with whom you worked that day is better for it. Um, as a researcher, I think that you have the potential to help many, many more people, but it's going to be further off. So it's just something that's nice for me to know that that day I could have had a positive impact on somebody's life. So those are, that's kind of my, that's the way I think about the research that I do. I want to also talk very, very briefly. Uh, I'm not going to go into what autism is, but I want to talk briefly about the kinds of things that I think are most important. That, that guide my study of autism. So we know now we changed in May 2013 the diagnostic criteria for autism. Uh, right now, autism is defined by difficulties in two areas, social communication and rigid and repetitive behaviors. So a few things that, are, that I think are important. One, I don't think that autism is necessarily a unitary diagnostic construct. I think that it means that at some point in development, everybody who gets a diagnosis of autism has a, a common phenotype for a constrained period of time. Um, there are many people who are alike. There are many people who are different. I, I, I don't, when I think about the ERP kind of markers that I'll talk about today, I'm no longer looking for an ERP marker that will 
index autism per se. I'm looking for ERP markers that index processes that are relevant to social and communicative function, which I think are going to be involved in autism. I, I think autism, we, all, we recognize that autism is a tremendously heterogeneous disorder. There are people um, whose IQs are 50. There are people whose IQs are 150. There are people with, m with fluent language. Uh, and there are people with no language at all. That said, to, what's remarkable to me isn't that heterogeneity, but the commonality. Right? If you take all these people who have such a disparate range of strengths and vulnerabilities, that to end up on the autism spectrum, they all have this common difficulty with forms of, of, of social interaction that many of us are doing in the first months of our life, that none of us are taught to do. And so to me, it's a, it's a really striking commonality. And so that's where I hone in on my research. I think that's what is, is most important for me to study. And then the last thing, too, is we know now autism, you know, there have been lots and lots of uh, crazy theories of what causes autism. We know now autism is, is caused by genes and it's caused by brain. To say those things isn't to say that it, it's wholly determined and autism is a developmental disorder. It's really important to me and also very, very interesting to me too to think about the interplay between the brain that a person is born with and then the world that they live in, right? Because we're born with a brain, but then through guiding attention, through reward systems, that those innate predispositions are defining the world that we live in. And this is, this is a, a kind of an illustration of it that I, I borrowed from, a, from Ami. And really, he, just the idea that by virtue of being born with a, a brain that may be less proficient in processing social information, a person on the spectrum is really is living a different life, right? They're, they're, there's a secondary impact of then being reared in an, in an environment which is less, less, less socially rich. So while most of us are, are trotting this top path and, and soaking in social experience all the time, really, from, from when we're born, people on the spectrum, I, I don't think they're not learning. I think they're learning about different kinds of things. And so really, I see it as a, I consider my challenge to understand how these paths diverge and then to think about strategies to, to reorient this lower trajectory into to help people function as well as they can in the world as it's currently built. And I should say, you know, social behavior can be defined in a lot of different ways. I'm referring to it in the most basic way, right? Social just means interacting with another person. I mean, getting on a bus, figuring out how to navigate a, a supermarket checkout line. I'm not talking about being the life of the party because th those are the kinds of things that present real a job interview, right? These are the kinds of things that can really have a high impact in a person's life. So I'm very interested in understanding these, how these pathways diverge. Um, the, I'm interested in understanding how the brain changes as a consequence of it. One of the ways that I, that I do a lot of, of research to try to understand it is with faces, because faces are so socially critical. And we can see evidence of specialization so early in life. There are you know, literally the people who taught me how to do neuroscience are, are in this room. So I'm not going to teach them anything. But for some of you who may not be really familiar with the method that I use, I, I'm going to give a very, very quick, quick account of, of ERPs. So ERPs are event-related potentials, which is just a, a way of analyzing the information that's contained in the electroencephalogram, the EEG. ERPs just mean that you have, um, you know, you make discrete events happen repeatedly so that you can separate the signal noise to see what is, what is true of the brain responding to whatever is happening, be it a sight, be it a sound. The way that we collect ERP is with these, there's lots of different manufacturers. The kind that I use uh, are these, these elastic nets which have small rubber pedestals embedded them in them. And then inside each pedestal is a small sponge. And at the base of that sponge is an electrical sensor connected to a wire that connects to a computer. And what we do is we just dip that whole net into a salt water solution and then stretch it over a person's head. And those sponges make contact with the scalp and then pick up the electrical activity that's produced by the neurons in the cortex. So what's nice about why I like ERP one of the things that's nice about it is that it's pretty user friendly, right? I mean, really, you have to be able to tolerate wearing a damp, tight fitting hat, which isn't, isn't fun, isn't comfortable, but it's, it's doable and it, it's apt for the kinds of groups that we're interested in working with people who might not understand a lot of complicated directions or infants or, or children. 
So it's a, it's a good tool for this population. The kind of information that it gives you is, is different from other kinds of brain imaging methods. It's really temporally precise, spatially poor resolution, but really accurate sense of when things happen is another thing that I like. I'm very interested in, in understanding how the brain increases its efficiency through specialization and, and, understand, and looking at weaknesses in social processing, not just in terms of whether this region is more or less active, but the efficiency with which a region does its, does its job. So we can look at that in a, it's accessible with EEG. I also like about EEG that you can take a complex process and because of the timing, the, the temporal information, break it up into a sequence of stages, right? So if we look at, looking at a face, we can see what's happening at 100 milliseconds is really index, indexing different kind of information processing than something at 500 milliseconds. When we think about the kinds of translational goals, right, if we want to be able to, to improve detection or to, to measure treatment, I also like ERP because it's cheap, right? It's expensive to acquire an EEG system, but then to do EEG once you have one is the cost of salt, water, and latex gloves, and it's scalable, right? EEGs are already in all hospitals, and we use them at the population level for auditory brain response, for screening, for hearing, right? So it's something that, if we figured something out, it's something that could be implementable, and that's appealing to me as well. It's also something that has already been used in typical development in an effective way to understand social perception. And this is a, an example of my favorite ERP component. This is a, an N170, so termed, because it's a, a negative, right, going down, a negative electrical spike that happens around 170 milliseconds. And this is the, the prototypic ERP marker of face perception. And really, it reflects a really early stage of face perception. So before this is an angry face or before this is mom's face, this is a face. And this is actually data from the first ERP study that I did when I was a graduate student, student studying with, with Jerry Dawson. And what we, we did in the studies, we, you know, there had been a number of behavioral studies and an fMRI study to show that people on the spectrum process faces differently. And so we wanted to look at this. We wanted to see whether people on the spectrum were showing this early face sensitive activity. And what we found, the people on the spectrum here are shown in red, we found that, there, that it wasn't that they didn't have an N170 response. They did. But what we saw that was different was that their N170 was delayed. So their latency to their N170 was much slower. And we saw that when we, we did measures of their actual their ability to process faces, face recognition, we saw they had a lot more trouble. And we saw that these things correlated together, that how quickly you encoded a face as such was associated with how good you were at face recognition. And so we sat down. This was myself and Jerry Dawson and Sarah Webb, who was a, a postdoc at the time and is now a, a professor at the University of Washington. And, and we tried to, tried to interpret these data and make a story about what it could mean for autism. And so we thought, OK, we, we see problems with face recognition. We see. Um, inefficient face processing, and we see that these things are related to one another. And what we conjectured is that rather than this necessarily being the, you know, a reflection of the autism, we thought maybe what we're seeing is a, is a symptom, is a consequence of growing up with autism. Um, and this is, we wrote, we wrote about it calling it the social motivation hypothesis. And this is basically the idea, is that what we're measuring, you know, N170 latency is a, is a marker of efficiency, a measure of neurospecialization. So we thought, okay, maybe they're not getting the right kinds of experience during important developmental periods because they're not paying attention to people, to faces. And then what we reason is that they're not paying attention because they're not driven. Right, because people aren't as rewarding, aren't as motivating to them. And this is, this is kind of the way we didn't say it at the time, but it stands to reason that this would be a cycle, right? that the more efficient you are at processing something, the more likely you will be to engage with it. And so this is the way that, that we started thinking about things. And it's, it's, it's with some revisions that I'll tell you about. It's the way that I continue to think about things. But I also think that it begs a few questions, questions that can be empirically tested. One, the idea that this cycle work works presumes that the, the brains are capable of specialization. So we're saying that they're not getting the right kind of experience, but we could test that, right? So if we measure experience, can we show that it's not just a system that is broken, that can't specialize? Is it, can we show that the, the aspect of specialization isn't just a problem per se? We can 
we can look at attention. When we talk about attention, we're talking about it in this grand developmental way. But we could also think about it in a much more mundane way. Right? If people are behaving differently when we do these experiments, if they're not looking at the faces in the same way, then we could see these differences in, in N170 latency. And it's not telling us anything about their life experiences, really. It's telling us about what they're doing in that experiment. And that's, a, to me, a, a more mundane interpretation. But we could test that. And the last thing that we, we could look at, too, is, is show that, that this seems to hold water, that, that variability here, that, that social motivation is actually predictive of neural specialization. So I want to talk about a few experiments that, we, that we've done over the past decade or so to look at these kinds of things. And I want to start with experience. And this is something that a lot of really the best work in this area has been done, done here. And we know that the, the brain systems that we use to process faces actually get recruited when we start to treat other things like faces. When we get really efficient at individuating um, things that all look kind of the same. And I think that the faces all look kind of the same, right? I mean, it's remarkable to me. I don't know if any of you do monkey work. I, I've used monkey stimuli, but I don't do monkey work. And I can't tell the monkey faces apart, right? But they're at least as different as all of you. And you all look totally different to me. I have no trouble telling you all apart. I mean, it's amazing to me how good we are with faces because all of our faces are kind of the same. Um, but when we get really good at telling individual things apart, we actually see some of the same kinds of behavioral processing strategies, um, and, and we see some of the same, um, the same brain regions, and we see an N170. So you know, uh, car experts show an N170 to cars. Bird experts show an N170 to cars. And this was a, yes, bird experts show it to birds, car experts show it to cars. Um, the, the, um, the, 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 this is a, I think to me it's a really, this is an important distinction because I think a lot of the other more, um, more via, other likely accounts of the way the brain works in autism some of the best ones, I think, think about connectivity. And we know that this process of specialization requires certain kinds of connectivity. And so it's, a, it's important to me to show this works. And so the question is, so if we have a group of people on the spectrum who are all expert in something, could we show that their brains are responding in a way that we would predict, in a, in a normative way? And that's a tricky thing to do, right? Because you need to either do you, one of two things. You could either find uh, a group of people with autism who are all experts in the same thing, and that's really hard to do. Right? I checked, there are no like, Ferrari owners of America with autism. There is no like, the Autism Autobahn Society. These things don't exist. Um, so the, what else could you do? So you could take people and get them, train them up. And people have done that, right? Susan Fasia, who's in Boston now, did studies like that. But to me, there's a really important difference between that kind of accrual of experience and the way, well, sure, the way bird experts accrue their experience and the way most of us accrue experience with faces, and that's affective involvement, right? Bird, bird experts have feelings about birds. What do, you, what do you call a bird expert? You don't call them a bird expert. You call them a bird enthusiast or a car enthusiast, right? Because this is an affective piece. And so what I want is I want to find something that a group of people with autism all are really experienced in, but do so in a first order kind of way. And this is, I didn't mention this before too, but this is another benefit of, um, you know, of, of being a clinician is you can get your, your ideas from experiments from the people that you work with. And so this is what we're pondering. And then I see this boy, um, and he gives me an idea. So this is a four-year-old boy who is on the spectrum, who was responded very well. We saw him when he was 20 months, and he didn't have any language. And now, as you'll hear, he's really, he's very verbal. But he's also, he's got a really particular interest. So pay attention. So what makes this guy tick? Right, and it's a, so it turns out this is a really common thing. So letters of the alphabet are really common interest for people on the spectrum. They're also, you know, there's a group of people on the spectrum, probably about 10% that are hyperlexic that learn to read pre precociously on their own. Um, so, but what this gives us then is we group people, if we find people who can read, we've got a people, group of people who with autism who are all interested in the same thing and who learned about it in a way that had affective involvement. Um, and so what we did is we did an experiment, we borrowed uh, so there's a, a, a researcher who um, actually, you know, so a, a, a research grandchild of Nancy Canwisher named Alan, Alan Wong, who is um, now at the University of Hong Kong, did studies showing that when you learn to read an alphabet, any alphabet, 
you get an N170 to that alphabet. And so he, it, when he was doing his research, he made up an alphabet so he could have an alphabet that nobody would get N170s to. And that's what this is. This is a pseudo letter. So what this lets us do, though, we, is we, we did the same kind of experiment we've done before to look at specialization for faces compared to houses, social and non-social. And then we compared specialization for letters to these pseudo letters in children who could read. And so if it's a generic problem with specialization, we're going to see problems in both areas. But if it's, if the way we're thinking about things in the social motivation hypothesis might be true, then we would predict that we're just going to see differences in the social. So when we looked at these, at these data, we found that for social, we saw the same kinds of things that we had seen before. Difficulties with face recognition, and we saw, again, this, this slower N170 response. When we looked at the, the non-social letters, we saw a couple of things. So behaviorally, they were good. The people on the spectrum were as good at phonemic decoding and word reading as, as the typically developing children. And, and, and they were average in these standardized tests. And when we looked at their brain response, we didn't see the kinds of differences that we had seen for the, for the faces. So these purple bars are the amplitude for, um, for, for letters. And the green ones are for the, the pseudo font. And we found is that both groups showed the specialization for letters. And both groups showed parallel latency. There weren't any delays. So if we think, so, so this, if we think about it back in terms of our model, so does typical specialization develop with experience? Well, at least for letters, it did, right? And so it, what that tells me in terms of this way of thinking about things is that the problem doesn't seem to just be here. If they're getting the right kind of experience, we're seeing the kinds of brain specialization that we would predict. So we took a step back. And we wanted to understand how attention influences these things. And this is also a really important question because it, it, it could kind of really explain away the idea that, that there's a difference in the brain processing social information in autism. So we, we first we looked at this in two ways. One way is with eye tracking. And I think that the, the general sense you'll get is that people on the spectrum look less to the eyes in eye tracking studies. I, my reading of the literature and in, in my experience, it's a pretty mixed finding. I think when you do the really uh, ecologically uh, valid, um, I don't know if, I don't know if who's afraid of Virginia Woolf is ecologically valid, but the really dynamic naturalistic, I should say, kind of videos, I think you really see these differences. But in my experience, and I think in other studies, when you do things like an ERP experiment, where a person is just looking at an immobile face on a computer screen. I don't know that people with autism always look at them very differently. So that's what we did. We wanted to know, you know, how are people on the spectrum looking at these faces during our ERP experiments? And so we, sh so we showed them lots of kinds of things, things that are like faces in terms of their kind of structure, things that are like faces in terms of being top heavy, uh, but very different, dissimilar in structure, and things that were just kind of um, had continuous features like, like greebles. And we showed faces upside down because it's a face processing experiment, and that's what you have to do. Um, we, when we looked at this, at this way, we really didn't see differences. So people on the spectrum, looked at the eyes as, as much as the typically developing people. So, all right, so we thought, all right, this suggests that when we're doing an ERP experiment, the people on the spectrum are engaging with the stimuli in the same way. We're not seeing these N170 delays just because they're not looking at the eyes. But we can measure that directly. And it's a really critical thing to measure because when you look, when you direct a person's attention to the eyes of the face, you actually see a faster a faster N170. And so the fact that people on the spectrum, if they're looking at faces in different ways, that could make their N170 slow down in a mundane way. So we, we controlled for that. So we did an experiment where we had a crosshair, a fixation crosshair pair on the screen. The, what you're seeing here is not veridical. The crosshair never co-occurred with the face. It would appear on screen beforehand. The crosshair would disappear. A face would appear. And we could be controlling them to be sure that a person is looking at the eyes, was looking at the nose, was looking at the mouth. And what we wanted to see really was, all right, is this really a problem with the way they're processing faces? Or is it just that the right information isn't getting to the retina? And it seems to be the former. So what we found is if you, if you don't even pay attention to where a person is looking, we saw the same kind of thing that we'd seen before, right? A longer latency. But when you break it down by region, so the blue bar is the latency for the typically developing kids, and the, the yellow bar is the latency for the kids on the spectrum, you see that overall, kids on the spectrum show the longer latency. 
but look, forcing them to look to the eyes doesn't fix it. In fact, it, it makes the delay more pronounced. The typically developing kids show this, this enhancement of the N170 efficiency, but the kids on the spectrum don't. And so if we reflect this back in the context of the model, you know, is attention an experimental confound? Maybe, but it doesn't seem to matter. That even if you control where a person's looking on the face, we're still seeing this, this processing inefficiency. And so the last thing that, that we, we looked at in this kind of series of experiments was to try to measure social motivation directly. And this was the work of a, of a graduate student named Celeste Chung. And what Celeste did was she thought, Social motivation is variable, probably variable in autism. It's certainly variable in typical development. The, kinds of the, the idea that your experience affects your neural specialization should be true, true for people with autism and typically developing people. And so what she did is she didn't even study people with autism. She did, she did a poster around the Yale campus and had people do a personality assessment online. And then she pushed people who, so we have words for this, right? What do you call someone who's really socially motivated? Right. And so she brought in the people with the, who were the most extroverted, and she brought in the people who were the most introverted, right? And, and she did a, a face processing experiment. So she showed them upright and inverted faces. Um, and we wanted to see if, if what we presume, this, this extroversion versus introversion, a proxy for social motivation, whether that would be reflected in their brain response to faces. And this is, what we, um, this is what we saw for the extroverts. And this is, for those of you who don't do ERP research, this is what's called an inversion effect. So when you, turn, when you present a person in an upside down face, rather than it abolishing an N170, you get this kind of paradoxical enhancement and delaying of an N170. Right? So you get a bigger, slower N170 when you show a face upside down. And that's exactly what we saw in the extroverts. And the way this is interpreted as a reflection of experience. Right? This is something that emerges over the course of development. And so we, um, we were interested in looking at this in introverts. And what we saw in the introverts was a very, very different profile of brain activity. And most specifically, what was different was that they didn't show this inversion effect. So if you think about the kinds of things, so how is this, how is this consistent with what we're thinking? It's consistent that this marker of specialization is different, is, is less specialized in people who have this reduced social drive, presumably reduced social drive. But how it's also different from what we see in the people on the spectrum, right? We didn't see any kind of frank delay in their N170. And so if you think about these things as kind of gradations of specialization, we're seeing a, a difference at a much more sophisticated level of specialization, not kind of just frank latency to upright faces. And so for our, our third test, does variability in motivation predict specialization? It does. And so, so taking all of these things together, it, it justifies to me this as a useful way of thinking about social development in autism. That said, I think that there are parts of it that aren't right. And let me, let me show you why. So let me show you some of the things, the, the main thing that I think is wrong. And I'm going to show you two examples. So um, this, is, um, this is a 14-year-old boy on the spectrum. And I'm, this, is, this is the... You know, for those of you who don't know an ADAS, the ADAS is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, and that's what you saw me doing before. And this is really the gold standard diagnostic test. The idea is you kind of talk and play, um, and you get a, a sense of how a, a person's social interest and ability. And so this is me working with a 14-year-old boy. So, so this guy, what did, a lot of social motivation, a little? I mean, not so much. So he kind of fits the bill. I have to tell you, the, the, just because it's, one of my favorite stories of the kids I work with ever. After this part of this, you ask a person if they want to get married. And I said, I said and do you think you're going to get married said, someday? And he said, no way. I don't need anybody asking me where I've been when I come home at 2 in the morning. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so let me show you. Um, so, all right, so this guy fits the bill. Like, social motivation could conceivably be the issue. But let me show you another 14-year-old boy. Um, who I think portrays a different picture, right? So I see this as a different picture, right? So when I look at this, I don't think this, for me, looking at this boy, the question isn't, he does seem to be motivated, but I think of different things, like how much longer is he going to be motivated in the face of these kinds of experiences? But when I, when I think about the, the variability 
in this do, this domain of motivation in kids, it, it strikes to me that that maybe the, it shouldn't look like this. Maybe what should be there is just, I, I still think engaging has to be a part of it, but maybe motivation or drive is one aspect. Of, there could, but there could be other reasons why a person isn't engaging, right? So drive might be one, but then there could be things that discourage a person from engaging, like the, this, this kid's experiences or um, you know, anxiety, forces that push a person away. And then I also think it's important to consider, I think it's a little circular, to talk about whether a person is drawn to or repelled from social interaction because it presupposes that that person is accurately able to parse what is and, and what is not social. And I think that's a potential problem too, right? If very, very, or maybe very, very early in our lives, we're failing to detect social information in an, in an accurate or in an efficient way. And so these are some of the ways that I've started thinking about things. And, and a lot of the, the studies that we're doing now in the lab are to try to look at these different areas. And I'm going to talk, uh, I'll kind of tell you the ways that, I'm, that we're studying them. And I'll talk about just a few studies, because I can't talk about all. But, but drive is, um, continues, drive, social motivation, social rewards continues to be, I think, very important. We've looked at it in a few ways. We've looked at basic reward. We've tried to understand reward in a more nuanced way, contrasting reward for social and non-social things. And then also the, the work of Cora Mukherjee, who couldn't be here tonight, but is studying at Harvard now, looking at empathy. And I want to talk a little bit about our, our, our work in reward. And when we look at reward, in autism, uh, there's a handful of ERP studies that have been done, been fMRI studies. What the ERP studies have, have shown is that when you look at um, ERP indices of outcome monitoring for when you win money versus when you lose money, people with autism, pretty, pretty typical. They didn't really look different from, from um, their peers. And what we wondered is if we make things a little more ambiguous, if we change the paradigm, so instead of winning or losing, uh, we make it winning versus nothing happening, so kind of win and draw. And so we use this paradigm uh, created by a colleague named Michael Crowley. This is a paradigm where you, 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 it's kind of like a slot machine for very young children. You pick a balloon and you either see a white square, meaning you didn't win any money. You see a dollar sign, meaning you did win money. And then you get your payout. It really is like a slot machine. And so, um, and we looked at how their brains responded. And what, what we found was it didn't really matter. I mean, whether it's win or lose, whether it's win or draw, didn't see problems in this really kind of basic reward system function in kids with autism. And typically, they didn't differ from typical develop, typically developing kids. And we didn't see that in the kids with autism or the typically developing kids, we didn't see it associating with any of the kinds of things that we think would be important, like social ability or, or autistic symptomatology or anything like that. And so. We thought, OK, so if it's not just a generic problem with reward, maybe it's a problem with social reward. And this makes a, a lot more sense to me, too. The idea that a reward system in autism is just dysfunctional in a basic way doesn't make sense because one of the symptoms of autism right, is, is finding certain things hyper-rewarding, having circumscribed interests. But perhaps, um, Perhaps having specific problems assigning reward value to things that are social in nature could skew development in the ways that we're talking about. And the way this is the the work of a different graduate student, Anthony Cox, who um, who did who did a couple of things that I thought were cool in this experiment. One, he he tried to use. Uh, uh, a parsing of social and non-social reward that I thought was stronger. So most, this is not a novel question. People are really interested in social and non-social reward. Traditionally, the social reward will be a, a picture of a smiling face on a computer screen, and the non-social reward would be money. Who would take this picture of the smiling face? I mean, not me. I mean, I would take the money. Um, so I think that that's kind of a problem. And so what Anthony did was he used a deception. So people came into the lab. They spun a spinner. Yes, that is grammatically correct. They spun a spinner, and they um, were either the participant or the observer, but they were always the participant. But they thought they were being observed. And the social reward was um, feedback. It was feigned video feedback from a person that was observing them. It was a, a, a person who wasn't observing them that they thought was. And the non-social reward wasn't money. It was, it was candy. And 
what Anthony found, and then there was also a no reward condition, right? So which is just looking at this boring gray pentagon. And what Anthony did, this was not, he didn't, we haven't done this yet in people on the spectrum. What he did, he used, um, he took typically developing people and then had them fill out these self-report measures, a, a self-report measure called the social responsiveness scale, which is a, a measure of, um, kind of autistic symptomatology and social function, but it's designed to be used in typical populations, and so it goes, you can be even, you know, it can show dysfunction, but can also show supranormative function. And what he found, so he took the people, he cut them in half, and he took the people who were the high, in fact, he actually pre-screened them, and brought in the people who were highest, um, showed the, the lowest levels of social, kind of social sub-threshold autistic traits, and the people who had the highest levels of social function. And I'm sorry, the highest levels of autistic traits. And, and what he, he looked at an ERP component called the P300, which, is in, which was elicited by a, a Q that they had gotten it right or wrong. And what he found was this. So this, this is the P300 amplitude in this chart. And so you can see, uh, if we think about P300 as an index of kind of dopaminergic reward system function, you're seeing less responsiveness for the least responsiveness for the no reward condition. You're seeing more responsiveness for the non-social reward, but then when you look at the social, you see this divergence. So the people who report really high levels of autistic traits are actually showing an attenuated response to social reward, and the people who are, um, who are reporting much lower levels are actually showing an enhanced response. And my first response, my first intellectual response when I saw these data was, you know, Anthony, you're probably measuring just some kind of um, vigilance or alertness, um, which we can't rule out. But what's interesting is when we look at all the kind of different things we measured, the only thing that P300 amplitude was associated with were these act was this measure of social function. So I think it's a, an interesting way of thinking about things. I think it's an interesting paradigm. And it's, it's a way that we're starting now to, to study and people on the spectrum. So think, moving from drive to discouragement, I'm really going to talk very, very quickly about the work that we've done in this area. The two broad tacks that we're taking are, um, we've looked at social exclusion, and then also, um, and at, one of the things I think is also, when you watch that second video of, of that second boy, one of the things that also jumps out to me too is how important emotion regulation is, right? How he handled himself in that situation would have such a, an influence on on the outcomes for him, right? So he he did okay. He he said in a in his um, you know kind of nerdy voice, you know, who threw that at me? Which probably gave the bully the the bully, you know, maybe five out of ten on, a, on the fod or the bully fodder scale, right? But what if he had jumped up onto the the, ch the the bus seat and you know started screaming and crying and yelling and tantruming, right? That would the bully would have eaten that up. And that would have made things probably worse for him in the long run. So how you, you regulate your negative emotions, I think, can really be important. We've looked at it in two ways, um, with irritability and anxiety. And, and really, just very briefly, um, one of these studies is already published, and one of them never will be. But the, you know, we published this cyberball paradigm, which some of you may know is a really, really simplistic video game where you throw a ball to two characters are on screen, and then they stop throwing the ball to you, and you, you get very upset reliably, robustly upset. It's called ostracism distressed. And what we find is that people on the spectrum, they are as upset by social exclusion as typically developing people, but we see a really different profile of brain activity in the process. And we, the way we interpret that brain activity is less sensitivity to the kinds of cues about what's happening, but similar emotional arousal. So um, that's one way we've come at it. And another way, and this is work that we do with Dennis Podowski, who's a, a colleague at the Child Study Center who does cognitive behavioral therapies for irritability and anxiety. And what Dennis has adapted an anger management protocol that he developed for people on the spectrum. And uh, this is the data that I show here are actually pilot data from a, a single person, which is really unusual to see anything. But what we do is we use a frustration induction go no go paradigm. And so we can see is it so if you look at pretreatment uh, this i apologize it looks like when i upgraded to yosemite this got blurry but the um if you you think about the line between the red and the green being an index of frustration so to be so to speak you can see that this is non frustration this is frustration this is pretreatment and this is post treatment and you can see the the difference between the lines post treatment is actually much smaller 25% smaller so it's neat to see that the mechanism that dennis believes he's targeting in his treatment are actually reflected in the ERPs that we see, which is a, 
which is that is the direction that we want to be going and seeing how our how our, our neuroscience can can measure actual change. And the last thing I'm going to talk about, and the thing that I'm currently having the most fun with in the lab is our, is our work in detuc detection. And we're, we're studying detection in two ways, uh, both thinking about kind of primacy, right? So one, um, kind of experiential primacy, right? That moment of eye contact. I'm, a, I'm obsessed with and fascinated by eye contact. The, the, um, that the visceral experience of making eye contact with another person and the rapidity of it is something I think is really important for understanding autism. The other way we think about it is in terms of developmental primacy. And so we're looking at <coughs> sensitivity, sensitivity to social information, biological emotion, um, early in development in infant studies, and also things that might compete for attention to social information, um, audiovisual synchrony, right? The idea, some of the ideas that Ami's talked about that, that, um, that uh, being overly attracted to perfect contingencies between audio and visual information could could skew um, development because you're attending to that instead of more more germane social information. And so, but I'm not going to talk about the the infant studies because really there are people in this room who could talk about them more articulately than I. So I'm going to talk about the stuff that we're doing with detection. And so, the other thing that I think is really neat about eye contact is that it you can't study it with conventional neuroscience, right? I mean, conventional neuroscience means you put a picture of a face on the screen and you measure a person's brain responding to it. But that's not eye contact, right? That's direct and averted gaze, which I think is something different. Um, so I want to measure it in an interactive way. Very, very few people are doing any kind of inter interactive neuroscience. You all here are some, uh, some of the people, the very few who are doing that. So this is the way that, that we've come at it. Um, so if you want to do an interactive paradigm, the first thing you need is someone to interact with, right? And so we started out with making, trying to use videos. And videos didn't work for two reasons. One, the time, it's really, we really, if we want to do the precise temporal methods of EEG, it's really hard to get videos to work so precisely. Two, non-professional actors cannot make viable fear faces. They are, if you are ever feeling down, send me an email, and I will send you a bunch of pictures of my colleagues trying to look fearful. <laughs> and it is funny. So what we did, and when I say we, the, you know, Adam Maples is, a, is a, a, a colleague at the Child Study Center who's really led a lot of this work and is, is gifted in a lot of, of technical ways that I am not. And so Adam used the, this, this movie animation software to create these faces that were highly realistic but could be controlled in ways that we can't control people. So really precise timing and yet have them move with within the constraints of human muscular and skeletal structure. And so, and he actually published this data set. So if anybody wants these, these stimuli, um, send us an email, we'll send them to you. And so we've got these, so okay, we've got an interactive partner, or we've got a partner, but then how do we make it interact? The other thing that's really interesting about eye contact and, and people, right, is that they do things, you can make them do things without touching them. Right? I mean, sure, touching people is a great way to make them do things too, but, the, but just I mean, you move your eyes, right? Like, I can just move my eyes to different people in the audience and you're going to respond. Like, if I just stare at someone long enough, they'll probably like smile nervously. Yeah, you see? Uh, and so, but I didn't touch it. Like, how, how did I t make, an, uh, make an effect on someone, right? Just my eyes. And so we need to do something like that. And so what we did is we, we paired an eye tracker with the EEG and with these faces so then we can have these faces that we can control in precise ways and have them then respond to a person's gaze, right? So have a person, when they look at the computer screen, when they look at that face on the computer screen, the face can, can look back at them or it can look away from them or it can smile at them, right? And so we can then, the idea then is we can look at elements of interactivity and because we're using ERP, which is so fast, we can really look at that, that moment of, um, reciprocity that I'm so interested in. So this is the, the first experiment that we did looking at this. And we did a really simple experiment. Uh, an arrow appeared on screen, pointing up, pointing down. And that arrow cued you to look to the eyes of the face or to the mouth of the face. And when you looked to the face, where you were supposed to look, one of two things could happen. Either the face's eyes would open, 
or the face's mouth would open. And so we have four things that could happen. You could have what we're interested in, right? You look to the eyes and they open and look back at you. You look to the eyes and the mouth opens, you look to the mouth and the eyes open, you look to the mouth and the mouth opens. And we were really interested in the first thing. Um, this is what it looks like. This is what the experiment looks like. Um, the other thing I should say too is, is what's really neat about these kinds of experiments is that they don't let a participant misbehave in the, you know, we, we, we have this fantasy that everybody's going to sit in our ERP lab and look where we want them to look, when we want them to look, but what's great about these experiments is that if they don't, it, it just stops. Nothing happens unless a person is looking where they're supposed to be looking, right? So it's good for, uh, for controlling for attention. So this is what experiment looks like. We don't use this setup anymore, but you can see this is one of the very, very few occasions where you're psyched to see laser beams shooting from a child's eyes. <laughs> And so you can see, so this is a, a, a girl, and she's looking at the, she, she's doing what she's supposed to be doing, so the faces are responding. And then you'll see a red face once in a while, and that's just to monitor attention. And so what we've got then is, these, is we have all these movement conditions, but one of them is what we are really curious about, is that moment when, when eyes look back at you. And these are data from, from typical adults. And what we find is that, and, and so people had kind of looked at this before. People have, had looked at the N170 when faces move, but not isolated where a person is looking, whether it's the eye contact. And what you find is we found this huge enhancement of the N170 really specifically to eye contact. So not you know, m watching a mouth move or watching the, the eyes open when you're looking at the mouth, but when you're fixated on the eyes and they look back at you, we see this enhancement in the N170. We also saw it, saw it in a different component called the P300. We then, in typical developments, wanted to see, OK, is this associated with any of the kinds of things that we think are important for social behavior? And they are. So if we create an index of how kind of the differential response for a person's you know, to eye contact versus other forms of movement, we find that it hangs together with self-report measures of, of social performance on the AQ and the, and the broader autism phenotype questionnaire. So that's neat. And then, we're, we're now doing this in kids with autism. Um, we don't, these data are preliminary. So I, I think these data, you know, hopefully, sh you know, we'll, we'll submit these to publish as they are. But these data are preliminary, but they're exciting, and I want to show you anyway. So this is, um, so this is the, the same paradigm, but in children, not adults. And so the blue line is typically developing children, and the yellow line is children with autism. And so you can see, this is that P300 component. And you can see this enhancement to eye contact in the typically developing kids, but not the kids with autism. So that's neat, and that's what we that's the kind of finding that we have in most of our studies. What's really cool about these data is that when, so this is a, this is, we're now running an R01 to look at, to do this in a, in a larger group of people. But when we got the grant reviewed, the, um, the reviewers wanted to see the individual's data, which is a pretty dangerous thing. It, it was a, it's a hard thing to ask for for ERP data because it can be so noisy. But we did it. And these are, so these horizontal lines are the individual's data. And so what's really unusual about these data from, from the sets of data that I've collected is that we don't see overlap. Is that the kids, the typically developing kids are showing this response and the kids with autism aren't. And so we'll see if it holds up in a later sample. And you know, I want to go back to the thing that I, to one of the ideas that I said in the beginning. So, you know, is this a, do I see something like this as a biomarker for autism? I don't. I see it as a marker of a social pro of a of a basic social process that is you know severely impacted in autism, and so that's why we see the difference. But I'm really I'm trying to think about these things not at the level of the diagnosis, but at the level of the process. And um, one more cool thing about this is just for the you know those those far-reaching kind of translational objectives that I said at the start, they're only. It's only realistic to talk about those kinds of things if you can show something about an individual, right? And most of the data that we show is about group means. And so what's neat here is that we collaborate with um, Peter Koenig and Michael Plokel at the University of Osnabrück. And really, they don't study autism. They study you know, ocular artifacts on EEG per se. And so they've worked with us to use data cleaning ways. So what's, what's cool is that we can do this experiment and really see this eye contact effect robustly in a person. So this is data from one person in one experiment, which again is just promising to us because, um, because this is really a 
a basic need if you're going to use any of these kinds of things in a translational way. Okay, so I, I want to wrap up and talk about why I think some of these things are important, and really more broadly, how I'm, how I'm trying to use these data and how I'm trying to study autism. And so I talked a lot today about N170 latency, right, which is, I think is important, but I think it's a very small part of a very complicated process, right? So what I think we can do with, with ERP, because of its temporal precision, is we can take something like looking at a moving face and carve it up into discrete elements, right? So if we think about you know, a 500 millisecond presentation of a face, we can look at all these different kinds of things. Very early, it's just sensory processing. Then it's you know, encoding a face. And then it's higher order things like emotion or identity decoding. And then it could be things like action perception system activity. And so we can take, we can take that process and break it up into different subcomponents and then think about you know, moving away from the idea that like this N170 captures the essence of autism, think about understanding autism in the context of performance across all these different domains of function. And when I say, you know, the, 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 title, slide, the title of the slide says Neuropsychology of Clinical Neuroscience. And, and for those of you who don't know what I mean by neuropsychology, so as a clinician, if someone said to me, this child's IQ is 97 and they're doing poorly in math, why? I don't have a clue. And you didn't even give me the right kind of information, right? You gave me this one aggregate score that reflects so many different things. And even if you told me something that's not aggregate, something that's more finite, if you gave me their score on a, a, on a matrix reasoning subtest of an IQ test, it's a, a small piece. And I, if I wanted to understand it what, as a neuropsychologist, what I would do is I would do lots of different tests that measure lots of different functions. And I would try to understand that child as the, not even the summation, because you, that again connotes the idea that you're trying to turn this to one thing, but as that profile of performance. But I think as a neuroscientist, and I think many of us as neuroscientists don't do that, right? We take that thing, we take that N170 latency, we take that regional activation in N area, and we, and we try to explain things with it. And I think this is a much um, more nuanced and much more sophisticated way to pursue things that I think could help us understand things in a more effective way. Because I, I think that there could be kids who end up with autism because they've got problems here, and there could be kids with autism because they've got problems here, and there could be kids with autism you know, who end up with problems with autism because they've got problems there. And I think if we're just looking at one thing in a given study, we're not going to see it. So I think it's important in that way. And there's mechanistic things we can do too, right? We can change the way that we try to understand the information. So if we have those kinds of paths defined, and we can make, because of the temporal information of EEG, we can make guesses about how different stages of, you know, because we know when these things happen in time. And so we can draw arrows on one end of that line instead of both, end, both ends, and then we can test whether it's true. So this is, you know, this is a, a kind of a, a model that Rafe Burney and I drew up about the way we thought things might be working in terms of how autistic traits could influence face processing and, and how that might be reflected in, um, in emotion recognition in the reading the mind and the eyes test. And, and, and we fit it to a group and, and it, parts of what we thought were wrong and parts of what we thought were right. And you know, specifically here, you know, we didn't find autistic traits driving variability in the N170. We found it driving um, sensory processing and um, action perception activity. And so and again, these are preliminary data. I don't know that these, that these will be what we finally come to in the final sample, but I think the idea is that we can make guesses about how these things are working together and then test them is really important. Um, another translational element that I want to talk about is, is trying to, to use these methods. You know, if we think that this, N, that this N170 or these kinds of things, and really what I would hope to have is an array of them, each indexing something that is important, but I do think this N170 is indexing something important, is then if, is, could this be a mechanism for treatment? And can we see it changing in treatment? And so the way that we're studying this is, is working with, um, with Pam Ventola and Kevin Pelfrey. And Pam um, administers pivotal response treatment, which is, a, is a, a really naturalistic form of applied behavior analytic therapy for autism. And we're just looking at their ERPs to faces over the course of the treatment. And what we find is as these kids get better, 
we can see their N170 changing. We can see their N170 specifically, their latency speeding up. And I think this is, you know, I, we're, I think we're in a period right now where we're going through, there, there's a wave of publications showing we did treatment and the brain changed. And I think that that is, uh, I think an, an alternative to that is impossible. Right? If behavior changes, you, you, the, the brain has to change. Right? So on the one hand, I don't think that this is um, groundbreaking. What I think is neat about it is that, you know, is because of, is I would hope that we wouldn't see this if the treatment they were getting was an executive function treatment. Right? Is, and that's what I think we need to see, is we need to see the treatments affecting the mechanisms that we think are relevant. And so this is, this is one way to come at it. Another way that, that they're coming at it is trying to use these interactive um, these, and so if we can use an interactive paradigm to measure a brain response, if we can use that paradigm to control, to shape a person's, to, if we can use a person's behavior to shape the paradigm, we can do the, the flip too, right? And so we can use these paradigms to shape a person's behavior. We can make games, right, that you play with your eyes that encourage you to look to the, to the most important parts of the face or to follow joint attention probes. And this is a, this is a very, very simple, simple game that, that Adam Naples developed. And so a face appears on the screen, and, and just like in real life, you don't know what the face is going to do. I mean, this not like in real life, this face really only does one of two things. It either looks at you, or it looks at one of four treasure chests on the screen. If in real life a face looks at you, what do you do? You look back at it, right? That's, if you do that in the game and you maintain gaze, the face smiles at you. If in real life a face you know, establishes eye contact with you and looks at something else, what do you do? You follow its gaze, and the same thing here. And so I'll show you a video of what it looks like. So I say this is a simple game, but I, you know, but obviously it's really incredibly complicated to get this to work. And so it's been immensely satisfying to see Adam succeed in this area. But this is what the game looks like. So if, if, if you look where you're supposed to look, if you look at the face, it smiles at you. If you follow its gaze to one of the boxes, the box opens and you get a jewel. And then the end of a block, you get your points. You see how many points you got, how many times you made the face smile, how many jewels you got. And so to me, what's really neat about this is that we can, um, you know, we have a, a paradigm that should elicit an ERP index that we think that is relevant, a paradigm that could modify it, and then we can by nature of having the, ET, the eye tracking and the EEG co-registered, we can be measuring the behavior change and seeing if anything is changing in the brain at the same time. And so we can look at all those, kinds of, all those different kinds of things. And now if I said the other data was preliminary, this data is super preliminary. But the kinds of things we're seeing so far are, you know, one, we can see, we can see the behavior change in the course of the experiment. When this, this yellow line is people on the spectrum, the gray line is typically developing kids. And so you can see these are, these are this is the data across eight blocks. And so you can see at the first block, it takes the people on the spectrum much longer time to elicit the smile, right? And I don't, well, we, don't we don't know why. I can't say this is a social thing. I can't, it could also be just a learning thing, right? The, the rules weren't explained to them. They're figuring it out on the fly. But what we can see is that over the course of the eight blocks, they're getting faster at it. We can also see how people are responding to the game neurally. So we see typically developing people showing this really big dip, difference in amplitude to whether it's a face giving them a cue or whether it's a cue about whether they got it right. And we're not seeing that in people on the spectrum. And then we can also try to get a sense of who is going to, who is going to change more. So if we look at how the N170 changes over the course of the experiment, can we make guesses about who, for whom it seems to be more malleable? And so what we see is what this shows us is that individuals with higher verbal IQ are more likely are those who show more change in their N170 over the course of the experiment. Which again, I don't know what that means. Maybe it just means that the people with the verbal IQ are, um, are picking things up faster. But it's, I think that this kind of approach is letting us understand things in new ways. So two more kind of um, what's to come. What are we working on in the lab? So obviously, I'm, I'm excited about this idea of interactivity in neuroscience experiments. And so we're trying to, to use this in different ways. So we do research in infants. And I'm very, very interested in this kind of the, that, that eye contact detection in this population. And so we can, uh, we can do that kind of work. And we're, we're trying to. Um, also, the, you know, all of the work that I've talked about today
to a study is not generalizable in the sense that it is focusing on people who have an, an average IQ or higher. And so um, we're also trying to bring in people who, who don't have language with autism, which is more challenging. But it's also these paradigms are also kind of neat for it, too, because you can build power. Because we're, they're, they're controlled by a person's behavior, we can use paradigms that let a person dictate how it proceeds, right? Instead of saying, look back at the screen, if they look away, we know they looked away. And so we put their favorite video back on the screen until they look to it, so things like that. Right now, our interactivity exclusively involves eye contact. We're working with collaborators who have built systems to measure other aspects of behavior. And so we're trying to make it respond to things like your posture, your facial expressions. We can have faces that smile back at you. And then we're also trying to, we are doing, but we don't get, really know how to make sense of the data. But we're also now um, using these wireless EEGs to record two people interacting. So this is really a game that we built, a very, very simple, a strategic version of Battleship, where when something good happens to him, that guy on the left, something bad is happening to her. That, that same cue means two different things for them and their outcome, so we can see how they parse it differently. And then the last thing I just I want to mention quickly is another thing that I'm really excited about is, is that all the stuff that I talked about today has been studied in, in other disorders affecting social cognition. And neither myself, and I would argue nobody, really has an idea to what degree these things are specific to autism or just reflective of a social brain that isn't working right. And so we're doing now a lot of these same measures in, in people who, with, who are in early course schizophrenia, right? So people who are at first break, so they haven't yet dealt with schizophrenia for long periods of time. They aren't yet having some of the iatrogenic effects and the medications, but are really um, are more, more pure problems in social. And, and we're seeing really interesting things. Um, this is the favorite figure that we've ever produced in the lab because it gives me confidence that we're studying something important. So this is just. This is the correlation over t the p-value of the correlation over time between um, a person's neural response to a face changing emotional expression in response to their gaze and their um, their social cognition on a self-report measure. And so this is you know so many statistics can be rigged or you can choose which tests to do. But what's so neat about this is it just tells us that the variance that exists that is meaningful is happening at this N170. Right, so it, it, and this is actually in a sample of people who have typical development autism and schizophrenia. Not all the same people, but all blended together. And so I think that we're looking at things that are relevant. Again, not reflective of autism per se, but of processes that are important in autism. Okay, and I've gone way over my time, and I apologize for that. But I do want to thank the kids, and the families, and the collaborators here and uh, around the country, that. Um, have helped get this work done. Most importantly, the people in the lab who do all this work. I should say there's a really cool fellowship um, in the lab, the Sparrow Fellowship in Clinical Neuroscience for people who have a, a, a bachelor's degree. And they would work with us both in the clinical setting in the clinic and doing research in the lab. I think it's a, it's a pretty uniquely didactic uh, clinical research opportunity. And we're taking applicants now. So if you know of any brilliant um, undergraduates, please put them in touch with us. And then lastly, I like to end with this slide. Julie Wolf is a colleague of mine who is a, um, is a clinical psychologist, and she runs support groups for siblings of people with autism, right? So which is a, it's a, it's a tough job to fill, is to be the brother or sister of a person with autism. And one holiday party, they all wrote up their Christmas wishes and crumpled them up and then put them into a bin. And she took them out. And there was, you know, I want another American Girl doll, or I want an Xbox One. But one of the kids' wishes was that scientists would find a cure for autism. And it's a nice reminder to me why we're all here. You're all, thank you all for being here, talk, listening to me instead of being with your families. So, yeah. I really enjoyed this a lot. I think it was brilliant, and I, I hope that those who are here can can understand some some subtlety of what you said. The importance of having clinical experiences. You cannot replicate in a laboratory. And the nuances of behavior and you know, the, the, the specific processes that you observe, even if part of the hypothesis that you are presenting there, shows how absolutely indispensable it is as neuroscience goes on. So I'd like that comment. Thanks. I, I remember the comment was that he agreed with the idea that it's really important to be a clinician and doing neuroscience.
I'm curious how you relate your work to rigid and restricted behaviors. Good question. So the question was, how do I relate my work to rigid and restricted behaviors? And I really don't. I mean, nothing that I do, very little, I'm trying to think of anything in our lab that's ever been focused specifically on that. And I, and I think less about it. I don't think it's not worth thinking about. But as I said, you know, only being limited in what I can know something about, I'm choosing to know more about the social stuff in autism because I think it's the most relevant and the most unique. You know, I think that some of the rigidities we see in autism are things that are also that we see in other in other disorders like OCD, for example. And so, this is where I, I invest my bang for the buck. But lots of people are doing good work. And in terms of, you know, this I think myself and other kind of people who think about autism in terms of the social brain, you know, it's a, there's a little bit of hand waving involved when we say that, and these things happen because you're not getting the the right kind of input, which I think is a little hand waving, but I think it's also a little true. I mean, I, I like to think of, you know, like. My favorite example is Stevie Wonder, right? He was one of my favorite musicians, and there's a guy who shows lots of stereotypes, um, but doesn't have autism. And so, um, yeah. Thank you, great talk. Thanks. I was wondering about the introverts, extroverts, um, N170 study, right? And there, um, you quite admirably pointed out that it wasn't exactly what you predicted, right? You'd originally gone in looking for differences in latency, but maybe it was something more subtle about not showing the inversion effect. But there was one thing that just like came screaming out of that graph, right? Which was the difference in overall amplitude. Yeah. And I can imagine one of two reasons why you didn't discuss that, right? One might be it's completely uninformative because there is no baseline against which to compare it, um, and so maybe we can't trust it. But it, it could also be very meaningful, right? I agree with you, and the reason I didn't discuss it is because our eyes see it, but our statistics don't, right? So that, I mean, the only thing that was significant is, was, the, um, was the inversion effect. But I agree, I mean, if you look at the means, there's a difference, but also, it, it's one of the things that's unfortunate, this is going to sound like an excuse, but you're from ERP researchers, you, you may agree with me. Grand average, because of the way that we extract information from the ERP, grand average waveforms can be kind of misleading, right? Because when we do it, we're just taking that one value at the peak. And so if there's a shift in latency, you know, it, it's going to look, the, the numbers that we extract, I'm not articulating this well at all, but the numbers that we extract can look very different from the grand average waveforms. <laughs> because it's not just a mathematical <laughs> average, right? It's a, you're taking out one piece for everybody, but that is reflecting everybody's wave, and so they can be pretty different. And I don't even know if that's the reason that it didn't, you know, I actually don't know offhand. What what the I don't remember the means offhand, but the the, the that wasn't significant. I'm wondering for some of the interactive um, work that you see happening in the future, how much do you feel um, some of the commercial EEG products like news or things that are being sold to consumers that are potentially can have like intense research? Sure. I don't know Muse specifically, and I, and I haven't evaluated a lot of them, although I would say like, I, I'm not aware of an EEG system that isn't commercial, right? I mean, I've paid plenty sure. for these systems. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, the, not, the, the concern I would have with some of these ones is some of these like dry electrode ones that you just put on your head is whether they're, they're measuring, they're truly measuring EEG or they're measuring, measuring muscular artifact. But I mean, if there was one that would work, I think that, that worked, I think it could be fine. And I, I mean, I have some colleagues who've messed around with them. We're, we're trying different kinds of EEG technologies. I don't have any experience with dry electrodes. But I think it could be great. It could be great. Everyone has one and they just plug data without having to come to a lab. That yeah, or without putting on gel, right? I mean, it could be a lot, a lot fa more efficient. <coughs> Taking into account that the fully developed brain is capable of enormous amounts of plasticity, from your clinical and research experience, at about what age do you think typical development ch children that their social brain is fully developed? Wow! Well, if you if you were gonna, I thought you, I was hoping you were going to ask me about face processing, in which case I kind of had an answer. Although I've no the, the exact answer. Girl. I mean, I don't know. I think it um, like eighteen to twenty one. I mean, just based on like non scientific. Ascertainment of myself during college. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and really, I mean, the real answer would be like, I don't know. It's. I think there's a gender interaction effect where I think some genders may never actually reach social maturity. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, thank you again for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh,